Okay, hello everybody, it's me, Man Alone. You might have noticed that this video started differently than other videos, and that's because um, today was going to be the debut of, of the new intro music, and I was really excited because um, I've been working on it for a while. You know, some of you had written some comments saying that maybe the intro music was a little too intense. And when I first heard that, I was like, ah, fooey, I don't want to hear it. But then I thought about it, and it's, it's like the reasons were that some of you were going through, um, you know, multiple videos of mine, and as it cycled through, there would suddenly be this, like, bang, guitar riff, which, like, is totally metal, and I think I want to keep it as, like, the outro. Um, but I thought, yes, perhaps we can do a little bit easier listening for the intro, I recently, you know, just I think two days ago, hit 2,000 followers, and so obviously it's going to be like, I assume, two or three weeks now till I start like making millions of dollars. So anyways, uh, I thought, you know, I'd invest in a new intro video as, you know, the channel gets bigger, we have to sort of adapt, and you got you to gotta spend money to make money, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of put feelers out for an intro video. We had a couple of teams do different bids, and uh, it was pretty clear uh, uh, very early on that one of the teams was just head and shoulders above the rest in terms of the vision they had for the video. You know, they took what we had with the seal and the music and the words, and they really elevated it in, in such a powerful way. Um, about halfway through the working relationship, so about four and a half minutes in, um, there's the, the crack started to appear. And uh, this is like, we there was one piece of the video specifically that we really had a difference of opinion on. The rest of the video was so good, I didn't want to like let this little piece get in the way of things. So we tried to work through it, but by like six or six and a half minutes, we pretty much realized that um, we had diverged uh, artistically and uh, you know, and we, we left on bad terms. And the worst part is, is like, you know, the, the, um, the assets were ruined. So like the previous intro video, I can't due to complex encoding. Uh, I can't play it as an intro video anymore. It could still be an outro, but it can't be an intro. And so I just have this new intro video now that is like 99.9% .9 perfect, but there's just like one little part of it that just seems so out of place to me. Um, and so I'm going to play it. I think maybe it's a case of like, maybe I'm just so intimately involved in the project that I'm like super sensitive to it. So you might see this and be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like the video looks great. Um, clearly you could see that the, the, uh, you know, the investment, you can see it, you can see like what's, you know, some money will do in terms of, of design and presentation. It, it is unfortunate that we weren't able, uh, able to bring the project to its completion. I really, uh, I've been upset about this. Um, but again, I, right now I'm, I'm sort of wondering if maybe I've just been, hypersensitive to this. So you could take a look at the video. Um, you know, I, if you think that this is okay, uh, that this, uh, doesn't set off any alarm bells for you, let me know in the comments and, and we, I guess we can keep this, but I'm nervous. Well, I, I'll, I won't keep going on, uh, without any further ado, here is the debut of the new intro video. It could be the debut and the last time, uh, we ever see it. can't put my finger on it it's like around 10 seconds in it probably you probably didn't even see it it's just I've watched the video so many times it's just like around 10 seconds in the video is amazing it's it, but so, like there's something off and and now that I'm like saying it out loud it sounds ridiculous that we would you know I I, I'm just sad. I mean, take take a look at it again and see see look around like ten seconds or so. There's like something that's off. Oh. 
right there. Ugh. If I get like me, you're probably sitting there right now being like, "Oh, uh, what?" <laughs> but I don't know. There's like honestly, I for some reason uh, it sounds ridiculous to say, but for some reason I just feel like around that eight, nine, ten second mark, suddenly a picture of, you know, the late American businesswoman and chemist Catherine Kitty Hack Darrow appears in the video. And I know that's ridiculous, um, but I just, I don't know. Well, whatever. Let me know in the comments if you notice anything. Maybe I'm like just kind of zooming in too much and getting too obsessive it is late etc but um we can't we can't get dragged down by that because we have a lot to do uh you know the the main event for this video is going to be combat and i've worked very hard to um you know put put a little uh tutoring together in a way that i think makes the most sense um, this video obviously will be beneficial to those who wish to play across a thousand dead worlds, which I hope you've picked up this, if not the hardcover, softcover, the PDF, I would love if, um, after this series, you could all play along. I, I had, um, I really challenged myself to learn the rules of this and to understand how, um, to get better at grid based combat like this. I don't know if, you know, maybe I'll do zone based combat or even theater of the mind or something. Um, but I just, something in me said, I want to add this to my skill set, And I, I, I took it upon myself to really drill down on it and understand it in a way that I can teach it to you. Because for me, teaching is honestly the best way for me to learn, because if I'm able to articulate it to you in a way that makes sense, I'm also articulating it that way to myself. Um, by no means am I an expert, but I think I have a pretty good idea of it. And I think I'll be able to go through it at least by not confusing you anymore. There are some parts that I'm a little bit shaky on, but, uh, <laughs> that is actually, well, uh, here, here's a rhetorical question. You know what the best part about being a solo RPG player is, is that, um, like, what do you do if you're playing a video game and you don't understand something in the video game or there's like maybe a glitch? Uh, well, that's happening to me right now with uh, Warhammer 40K Rogue Trader, which is, as I've said, an extremely glitchy, very good, but very glitchy game. So what are my options? Well, I can go complain about it on a message board. Um, I can write a bug or error report. I can complain about it and sigh and throw my controller. But if you're a solo RPG player, uh, <laughs> you could just email the dude who wrote the book, uh, which I did this morning to Alex T. And Alex responded in about three hours with like a 6,000 word reply addressing every single one of my questions. Um, and so I will share the insights that I got from that throughout the video. But I also, if I remember at the end, I'll go through the conversation that we had. It's not really a conversation. I like listed the questions and then they responded. But um, just to just to give the the feedback that Alex gave for for the most part, a lot of stuff was very easily cleared up. Like after I read what he wrote, I was like, oh, oh yeah, that makes sense. A few of the things, you know, he's pretty straightforward with by saying, yeah, this is something that was underdeveloped. I want to work on it more. Um, you know, it doesn't work that well in its current state. And I really appreciate that. Uh, I just appreciate the way that Alex takes uh, feedback. And, um, you know, I, I feel like uh, it, it, for my own game development, uh, I really need to have that same sort of receptivity. If you ever look in any videos where someone's like reviewing any of the Black Oath games, Alex is responding like, just being like, wow, those were such great points. And there's no sense of like seething or anything, which is such, um, it just, it's just a, a real strength of character. And I really uh, uh, love this game. We're, he's sending me some other games as well to, to take a look at and review with uh, all of you. I'm, if I want no demand being made of me, but, um, uh, so we'll, we'll maybe be able to take a look at those. Uh, I do want to get back to dragon Bane for a little bit after I might even intersplice a dragon Bane session 
in uh, between these uh, tutorial videos for Across a Thousand Dead Worlds because I'm just itching for some Dragon Bane. Um, I've been playing Coriolis in a group. That game is awesome, and I cannot wait to get my hands on the starter set. Um, it just was such an awesome session tonight. I can't even explain it to you. It's just like firing on every cylinder. Oh, it was so good. The GM was so good. Everyone was great. Um, okay. So uh, before I start, and you'll have to forgive me because I was I was doing a good clip here, and I don't want to get sidetracked by waffling, but um, I do have some exciting stuff to talk about. First of all, we just had our, our next video. I'll link below. Um, the, the one, the only Goober, at Goober McSnorford, the YouTube channel, um, posted uh, the next video in the series of the solo RPG Round Robin. So that is up now. I posted it on my community page earlier. I hope you take a look and we'll, we'll link it down below. And then next up is going to be the venerable Dice Tales, who um, that should be by the time you watch this, hopefully in the next, that video should be up in the next 48 hours to continue the fun. Uh, I know that a lot of you have reached out. I know that I did respond to some of you. I know that I wasn't able to respond to some of you. I just have been receiving a lot of emails, so I do want to apologize if I didn't respond to you personally. Um, but just know that I at least everyone who sent me interest in uh, joining it, we're probably not going to be able to get to you this time just because the list is quite um, long. We still have some people in reserve. It's possible, but as things look right now, we might... Um, we, we might have enough as is, but just know that I have, uh, taken down the name of your channel or, or whatever, just to put you on the list. Cause I just have a feeling we'll probably do this again because this seems really fun and, and it's a, a form that we can kind of build on. Uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, impressed, uh, so far and just looking forward to, uh, to the rest of these videos is going to be really fun in a way to discover some other solo channels and to see different approaches to solo playing. Okay. So check that out. Uh, the other thing is, uh, is wild in my wildest dreams. I, I, I can't believe, uh, we have another celebrity in our studio. Uh, you're probably thinking, okay, man alone, like, how are you pulling this off? You had Gene Hackman, um, you know, not even two weeks ago. And now you have who you're <laughs> not going to believe this. I wasn't able to believe it. Um, but again, I got a call from my agent. My agent said, yo, you know, usual stuff like Manalonio, you know, you might, my, my number one golden boy. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Rufus like whatever. And then Rufus says, uh, I got news for you. So X, I don't want to say X, Y, Z person is going to stop in the studio. And I'm like, uh, excuse me, baking powder come again. Cause I'm still doing the Wayne's world jokes. And, uh, yeah. And now they're here and they're walking in right now. So <laughs> not, I'm going to do it again. I'm not even going to say, um, who it is. I don't think they need any introduction and, um, yeah, enjoy. I'm, I'm just really happy that, uh, this, this is a possibility. So, Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. You can sit right here. Absolutely. Nice to meet you as well, sir. Yep. Right here's the mic. Yeah, just lean forward. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna stand like uh, by just to assist with things, but uh, we're gonna have someone else take the mic. Hello, everyone. It's me, Javier Bardem. You probably know me from such movies as No Country for Old Men or Dune where I play Stilgar. Anyways, today I'm here to talk to you once again about fate. When's the last time you ever lost anything on a coin toss? Don't answer that. Because the better question is, when's the last time you lost anything on a dice toss? The fate middle only from Tower House Creative. Boy, do I wish that I had this when I made the horrible mistake of playing a game of chance with the old gods, the blood gods, whom I went to and asked for eternal life. And in response to this, they made a bargain. I traded my soul. I gave them my soul, and I watched the blood god Oshiwasho eat it in front of me as I slowly realized 
the exchange that I have made. I do now have eternal life, but it is as this machine made out of a sort of living metal. I can never die. And so, unlike you, I am not running out of time. But good news. TowerhouseCreative.com has enjoyed the relationship with the fans of Man Alone so much that me, Javier Bardem, is here to announce that the 20% off deal will be extended to next month, May 12th, in honor of Solo RPG Month. This is not a surprise. The Fate Mill was lovingly crafted by a solo RPG player from Tower House Creative. An oracle that's in your hands or your pockets at all times. No need to drag around heavy books. Everything you need is right here in front of you. And so now, between now and May 12th, you can you still use Man Alone 20 for 20% 20 off everything on the website. Including the Dietic D20 that this Man Alone is going to talk to you about just in a minute. Anyways, please, if you're going to gamble, if you're going to roll the dice of fate, do it at TowerHouseCreative.com. Have a good day, friendo. <sighs> Holy cow. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yep. Oh, okay. Oh, shit. Uh, no, that's fine. I'll clean that up. That's okay. Wow. Just walked uh, like right out of the wall there. Holy cow! Did you see what I see? Did you see that? Did everyone? <laughs> Am I dreaming right now? In the studio is actually Javier Bardem, and he was talking about the fate mill again. And this is incredible because, um, this is like such an amazing timing for a couple of reasons. So first of all, um. They sent me uh, uh, the Dyadic D20, which is this amazing dice set that is extremely versatile. Uh, there are instructions here to use it as a D20, a D2, a D10, a D100. And um, we are. this is really great, actually, for Across a Thousand Dead Worlds, because we're going to need all of those for the instructions that I'm about to tell you for combat. These are the perfect dice for Across a Thousand Dead Worlds. And... Um, it comes again with a little personalized, well, I guess the, the delightfully crafted note by Harold S. Trent, lead investigator, Team Tower House. Comes with my third sticker here, adding to the collection, looking great, looking suave, looking wonderful. And I'm going to show you as we're playing Across Thousand Dead Worlds, and this is not legit, this is not a gimmick. These are actually the perfect dice for this game. Um, and, uh, once again, just want to notice there was no requirement for me to review anything. Just wanted me to have it, try it out. And I dig it. Uh, so we're going to use these today, but here's the best part folks. And Javier Bardem didn't, didn't even mention this. No problem. I obviously like, I'm not, I'm not biting the hand that feeds me. Um, oh, what's that? Okay, my producer just said that, uh, you know, anyone on this podcast that shows any relation to anyone living, dead, or unkillable is purely coincidental uh, and satire, satire, satire. Okay, um, well, because of, in honor of Solo RPG Month, and because you all, uh, because you all have been incredible, and this has been an amazing partnership, and so many of you have, have picked up the Fate Mill I'm happy to announce that in addition to extending the promo code, we are going to have a giveaway uh, for a fate mill of your very own. Now, I haven't quite decided how we're going to do this yet, but there is actually going to be two giveaways uh, uh, sponsored by Tower House Creative, and one of them is going to be for the fate mill. Um, and I will say, I'm also, we're also trying to figure out how, right now, this is only for those in the U.S. However, we're, we're brainstorming right now some ways that maybe we can get, we wouldn't be able to get this because I'm not even playing, shipping is like $50 to $70. But 
Uh, we're coming up with some ideas, some alternative things. So maybe we'll have a little bit of a, a, a domestic and intercontinental champion. I cannot understand. It must be the hologram, right? Is that what's... Oh, it's the peace sign. Okay. Um, so uh, once once I figure out what we're going to do, that, what I know is that one of the competitions I would love is going to be for all of you. And then I might do one for those that are participating in the round uh, robin with this other thing that I have in the works um, that that uh, uh, Tower House Creative is sending. Believe me when I say that this prize that uh, is potentially the second prize here, it, let's just say I've talked about it a lot on this channel. And so looking forward to both these, I'll announce the details with that. But thank you, Tower House Creative. And again, what I love about this is that not only uh, is this not a paid partnership, um, and and I couldn't be happier. All I want is treats. I'm not in it for any any of the bucks. I just want the treats. So my dreams have all come true. But not only am I not getting uh, is this not like a financial relationship, but uh, also I'm giving stuff away. All right. So so that to me is the is the gift that keeps on giving. Clark, we're gonna pay it forward. We got some prizes to give out for Solo RPG Month. I am so happy right now. Um, about that. Thank you, Tower House Creative. I see us, you know, as like like Care Bear and Care Bear cousins. You know, it's like that Care Bear cousin connection. So, thank you. Uh, some some real dudes there. Uh, aside from the bit for a second, I just do want to say this. Um, Tower House Creative is a really is a small company, and uh, this happened to me on a previous uh, social media site that I was on is like when you reach a certain amount of followers, you start to get these emails, a lot of people that want you to do reviews and product placements and interviews and stuff. And, and look, it's business, it's whatever. Um, I don't generally like to do that stuff. But uh, uh, Elton from Tower House Creative reached out to me in really good faith. And this is just somebody who is trying to do something they love and put out good stuff in the world and, and grow their business. And, uh, I just want to help. So I am, I'm truly not, um, like being sponsored by them or anything right now. I hope that we get to the point where we can keep, uh, sending some, some dough their way and, and expand that company. But, um, I think that it is in my nature and in the best interest of all of us to, uh, to realize that we usually are better off cooperating than competing when we're in, in like a similar place. Um, and so, uh, yes, I will sometimes have some friendly competition with people, but, uh, I just, I, I encourage, uh, all of you to just at least check out towerhousecreative.com. See if you're interested in anything. Uh, and that was really nice. They're extending that promo code for the whole month. So, Oh, I don't want to make any hand signals because there's going to be balloons or, or thumb. I think it started doing thumbs up now and stuff like this. Yeah, jeez, oh, I don't know who 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 authorized that. Okay, um, so we talked about the round robin. We talked about the fate mill. We talked about the mysterious other prize. We talked about this fact that I'm trying to figure out an international prize. Um, so I think now at 23 minutes in we're finally done with all the bullshit and i will actually put a time stamp on this because otherwise this would be straight up abusive of people's time if they literally came into a video and did not get to the meat of it for now 24 minutes because i can't shut the hell up all right so i am going to attempt to systematically go through these index cards because i believe that the contents of this or the the what is listed on these the different components of combat i believe that they i have put them in the uh, the best order i can to teach you these and and um again if you if you're somebody who doesn't who gets a solo book and you don't quite know how to get going with it um my recommendation is index cards. Index cards are great for setting up areas to put chits in and to like keep track of different meters, figure out the stuff that you need to keep track of and what the priorities are. Um, this is really a process that I do almost every time I'm going to play a solo game that is less... Um, like there are some solo games, and to, to their credit, this I think is great, like... Um, that you could just pick up and read through it and just play as you're reading through it. 
Um, but then there are games where you really need to understand what the system is. And I will say it is so satisfying when you get to the point where it starts to click and you can just like swim around in it. But it does take a little bit of work. I understand that. And so I want to take I want to lighten that load a little bit and talk about combat. Uh, so this will be part two of the how to play across thousand dead worlds. This one is going to be focused only on combat because combat is a tough nut to crack and one that I think deserves its own video. Um, I might mention combat again in a future video if we talk about zone-based combat, which is the sort of pared-down version that's presented in the book. Also, reading um, just the PDFs of some of Alex T's other books, I actually think we could probably adapt this into a theater of the mind type combat as well. Um, but let's... I'm eager to figure this out here. I want to I wanna add this to my tool belt, so let's talk about it. All right. So, Combat. First thing I just want to sweep off the table is stealth. Stealth does come up pretty early in the combat section. And it was a, a bit of confusion. In fact, it's like the first subheading mentioned here. Uh, if any player character is being stealthy, follow the rules on page 80. They might gain advantage or avoid the combat altogether, depending on the results and choices. So let me say up front, I think half of that works well right now. I think maintaining stealth is going to cost five stamina. We'll talk about what stamina is, but it's basically... You get 10 stamina around, and most moves on average are five. So it's similar to other role-playing games of like you get two moves. But, um, you know, this is not necessarily a game where you are uh, like heavily loot rewarded for combat. Um, and so it's combat is part of the narrative. It's going to come up. Sometimes it'll be unavoidable. Obviously, it can be very exciting. It can create a lot of feels while you're playing and can be a source of tension and winning is such a great feeling too. But uh, for those who are used to coming from like a grinding, grinded out, you know, Final Fantasy three type leveling up in the over map, overland map, um, you got to change your mindset for for solo gaming, because especially a game like Dragon Bane, if you try to go smash it into every combat, you're just going to die very quickly. And so, um, so I think stealth will work for that. Uh, but this is part of the FAQ that I'm going to do at the end of the video because I did reach out to Alex uh, regarding some of my confusion about stealth. And uh, my confusion was acknowledged. And Alex did say that this is something that at its current in its current form does, is not quite working exactly as he intended it to work. And that um, he needs to make some tweaks, some modifications uh, to this, but we'll we'll discuss that in the FAQ section, or if it comes up in a more in a, a more situated uh, area than this, we'll glide past stealth for now. The next uh, thing is going to be encounter reactions, and encounter reactions are very simple. Uh, and I, I, in fact, I'll just read the the paragraph. Almost everything that the player characters encounter during their travels will attack on site, but there's always a chance, however small, that they get lucky. Roll a d10. 1 to 8, the creature attacks. 9 to 10, they ignore the party and leave the area. Okay, So this is especially for any like bestial characters in the same way that you know not everything you approach in the wild, even if it's an apex predator, is going to pounce on you. And so this is just a d10 roll. And there's a 4. Um, and so that would be combat, right? The only way that we're going to get out of combat is if a 9 or a 10 is rolled. And so you have this 20% chance that the thing's going to walk away. And honestly, sometimes that really won't make sense because there's nowhere for it to walk to, especially if you're like at a, termination, a terminus of a hallway or something. Um, let's talk about how to set up combat because that's the first thing you're going to want to do. Again, these come with the hardcover, at least uh, the ones from the website. Nice little, nice little kit. You get like three of these. They're two-sided, and then you get these little chips. Five of these for your characters. Um, if you have NPCs or if you're playing with a GM, you could have up to five in your party. And then I think ten of these ones, which are the enemies. Uh, if you, for instance, bought the soft cover from Amazon and you don't get those things with it, you can just print one of these out. In fact, this is probably a little bit easier to use uh, for my money, although you'll have to fill in the cover. So um, that's number one is uh, we have the combat grid. We take it out and we need to place cover. Now, this one quite nicely has some cover already determined. 
It's a little confusing because it's hard for me to see, and I do have a little bit of some vision uh, issues, but um, it's hard for me to see what is partial cover and what is full cover. And it's important to know the difference because partial cover is going to reduce the enemy, uh, or I'm sorry, for those doing ranged attacks, partial cover is going to reduce the, um, the combat skills of those attempting a range attack by two. So partial covers like that, it's sort of, I don't know if you could see it, but it's striped. And then if it's all the way filled in, that's full cover and it's gonna reduce the, the combatant, uh, the person who's attempting the ranged attack, their combat skill by five. Um, so if you're playing again with a GM, they can just assign some cover in different places. If you're playing by yourself, hell, I don't know. You could take these chips and throw them up in the air and see where they fall and then say, okay, this is partial cover wherever these fall. Uh, for my money, I again, uh, really love this D20 table and the idea of rolling on it more than once. Now, again, uh, for this dyadic D20, we can use one die here, right? Because one die is, even though it has zero to nine twice, the um, outline ones are gonna be one to 10, and the ones that are filled in are gonna be 11 to 20, so it only takes one die. So to roll a d20, I look at this, it's not filled in, that's a six, and I'm gonna go to the six table here, and that's four spots of full cover, and I can fill that in on my grid, if this was a blank grid especially. And, uh, you know, depending on how complex the environment you're in, I might roll this two or three times. And so I'm going to roll again on D20. This is nine. And so nine, now I have this. There might be some duplications, but fill in some cover. Make it interesting. Make it unique, right? Uh, and so then after we figure out cover, we are going to roll a 1D4 uh, to determine position. Now, technically, I could roll a 1d4 on this because the way to roll a d2, which is like a coin flip, is that if it is uh, an outline number, then it's a 1, and if it's filled in, it's 2. And so you might say, oh, well, I can do that on both dice, right? If it's, you know, that's not filled in, so that's 1, that's 1, that's 2. Um, I know this might be remedial for some of you, but if you're new to this, the problem with, with that is if you roll two dice, you're never going to roll a one, right? Because you're, you're going to get a one or a two on both. You'll never get a zero. So that can't be a true D4. Technically, you could get a true D4, um, I guess, if you rolled uh, this four times. I'm not even sure about that. It's just not, uh, you might as well flip a coin twice or use the silly, stupid Caltrops. Um, I recently discovered that a lot of you hate the way I roll dice and I love that. I'm just going to keep rolling these plunk dice that I do because I have a friend who goes like this for nine minutes and I can't take it. Just drop it. It's random. All right. A one. So the, we, we're going to roll this D4 and the result of the D4 is placement on the map. So I'll place mine first. I rolled a one, which means north. And so go up here. This is the north end. You could see there is like a little bit of very faded N right there and um, you always want to put on the first row like the opening on the first row and if the first row is filled and you have more characters than this which would actually be the case in this one then you start filling in the second row then the third row etc now we'll roll again to see this a three and a three is south okay it's like clash of the titans so we have a north and south battle right here this is a south end and we'll just start with one one combatant um, to, to illustrate this. But that's how you do placement, right? And so you'll do it for however many factions there are, which will usually be two, right? You'll do it twice. Now, say you both rolled north, you can do that, but you'd have to put some separation here. You have to put at least a couple of hexes of separation. You can't start them right on top of each other. Um, honestly, if unless it was something that seemed feasible, if we were in tight spaces, I have to tell you, I would probably re-roll until I got a different side because that would just that just seems um, a, a a cluster and it and and uh, I don't know that that's just my sense is that I would re-roll that. So you're going to determine those positions. And then also you're gonna roll a D6 to determine if there is a surprise. Now, sometimes context you might automatically know just based on the narrative, like hell yeah, we surprised them because we walked on a roof uh, 
and then jumped down around them and surrounded them, and that's fine. You could just do that by fiat, but otherwise you roll a 1d6. I roll a 3, and 3 to 4 means that the PCs are surprised. And so since I'm surprised, what this means is that the enemy is going to get plus 2 to their initiative roll. Now, if the enemy was surprised, we can also get a sense of what they were doing when we surprised them by rolling a d8. Um, this is an example of an area of this game where it's like, this is something that you're going to have to sort of determine how how often you want to do these roles, how much it's going to help you to to fill in the, the fiction of it. And sometimes it's okay to skip stuff like this, okay? But I feel that when you do fill this stuff in, it just helps to create a better scene picture. And so let's just say that we, we surprise these guys. These guys were caught off guard. And we roll a four, and that is they were patrolling or keeping watch when we came in. So hip, 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 right? Um, and so, again, when you surprise someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that you for sure go first. However, it does mean that you're going to get a plus two to your initiative. The high roll of initiative wins. And um, you can spend five stamina once per round to increase or decrease your place in the initiative. And we'll talk about stamina and place and initiative and why that might be important, but just hang tight. So essentially to determine initiative, you are just going to um, roll a D10 and add speed. We'll talk about speed potentially, but let's keep it simple right now. And so again, I can use my dyadic here and we'll roll this for a D10 and that is a nine. And so that's a really good roll uh, for the combatant. Again, we're gonna make this die usually the enemy, red for danger. Um, and then I rolled a six. Uh, now, if I had the surprise, I still wouldn't have initiative because that'd be six plus two. So very clearly here, this this one is going first. They have the initiative. Sometimes you'll want the first initiative. I mean, if you watch American football, sometimes usually you want to receive, but sometimes you want to kick off. And one of the reasons you might scoot down in the initiative, spend some stamina to drop, is because you want to see what... Um, what the enemy is going to do, and you want to hang on to your stamina until you do that. I will say that uh, the system for dropping down in initiative does not quite make sense to me, because why would I spend five stamina to decrease my position when instead I could just make a move and then not do my second move? Um, I I think that... and. I could not be seeing the full picture here, but this is just what I thought while I was reading it. I think a better system would say five stamina to increase your initiative. And if you want to drop in your initiative, you can drop to any place lower than where you are currently at, the next one lower. But to spend five stamina to decrease your initiative really doesn't make sense because I would rather spend the five stamina to set myself up a defensive maneuver, to move, anything like that. But anyways... We could just do that and see what works. Um, all right. So we now determine the initiative and we talked about cover. And again, minus two for partial cover, minus five for full cover. And that is going to be a minus two or a minus five um, on the uh, ranged combat skill. So this basically means it's going to be harder for you to hit someone in cover and harder to be hit in cover. I know that's fairly obvious, but I just want to be comprehensive. All right, we talked about placement. We talked about surprise gives plus two initiative, stamina. Um, at the beginning of the game, and the standard is you get 10 stamina per round. Again, when you make an action or a series of actions, that's your turn in combat. When everyone has taken their turn, that's one round. You'll continue rounds until somebody escapes, dies, dies. The narrative takes over, surrenders, whatever. Um, but essentially, uh, 10 stamina just means that you have uh, these 10 stamina points to spend in any way you'd like. And truly, you do have a lot of flexibility here, more so than you might have in other games. For instance, you can move, which costs 5 stamina to go 1 hex. You can move before you take an action, after you take an action. You cannot move. 
you can not spend all of your stamina so that if somebody else attacks you, you can bank that and then use a defensive maneuver. Um, it's a lot of strategy involved in the usage of this. Uh, and if you're ever in zero G or underwater, everyone's stamina is reduced to eight. Now, in a previous video, I had stated, why would anyone do anything other than a heavy attack? Um, so a standard attack is five stamina. All right, we'll talk about what the attack looks like. That's one of the more uh, important pieces to this is which, why I made a set of flow charts for it that I'll get to. Uh, a heavy attack is uh, the regular attack plus an additional 1d6 damage. Why wouldn't I do that every time you say? Well, it's because it costs eight stamina. And again, in a previous video I said, well, why wouldn't you do that? You know, what's the point of that? There's nothing that costs two stamina, um, but there is, and it's a defensive maneuver. You can basically trade in stamina to decrease an enemy's attack roll as a sort of dodge or parry, and we'll get to that. But again, right here is a menu of different costs for stamina. My recommendation is that this is one of these tables that you want to take a picture of, you want to write out, you want to have a quick reference because you'll be ordering from this menu a lot, okay? Um, but you don't need to know everything right off the bat. Uh, to, you know, to summarize, there's a standard attack, heavy attack, fast attack, defensive maneuvers. You could switch your weapon for five stamina. You can retrieve an item, you know, maybe a you find something that's like uh, able to heal up during a, a battle or you find a improvised weapon um, and then adjusting your initiative by one is five stamina again even it's by one that just doesn't seem uh, very good and then maintaining stealth is five stamina per round and, and we'll talk about why that doesn't quite work so well right now combat stance is an optional rule uh, we're going to steer clear of it for now. This seems like something that is uh, optimization, and I think let's work on the Sherlock Holmes sort of economy of space left in the brain thing. Um, it is five stamina to move one hex, or much like you know five year or anything, you can use up all your stamina, uh, or I guess not all of it, but ten stamina to do a dash. And that means you can move twice as many spaces, but you use up um, an action. That's mostly to escape. Anytime you move off the play area, you've escaped. Anytime anyone does that, they've escaped. All right. Um, from the combat. Okay. Um, oh, this is probably important in, for, in terms of moving rules. No combatant can move twice, no matter their speed or enhancements. But in, and that means two turns, you can't move for two turns, but you can move double distance, one extra hex uh, for bipedals for, um, you know, uh, using the, by forfeiting the, the action for that round. And actually that is another thing that I wanna clarify. Does it cost five stamina or do you just completely forfeit the action? Cause actually I think that's what it is. You can't even do an action with it. It doesn't matter the stamina. All right. So we're going to start with close combat, and this is where I'm going to talk pretty carefully because I, uh, when I was rehearsing this, because I really wanted to teach this to everyone in a way that would make sense, um, I realized that I have to talk a little bit different than I normally do. My normal thing is to just like uh, move, always like move forward and to link together words and make sure that all sentences flow together and have like an interesting cadence. I'm not doing any of that. I want to be more careful. So in order to get ready for that, I am going to just pause right now just to orient myself and get ready so that I can give you a good, concise explanation. I'll be right back. There's not going to be a pause for you, just for me. See, I told you it wouldn't pause for you. All right. So you could see from the back of this card, this was like my first attempt to create a meaningful flow chart for this to explain it. I wish I would have kept all of the iterations of this because there are about 15 of them. What I ultimately landed on was a, um, I used, uh, what the hell is this app called? Freeform, the Mac app, which I actually love. Um, wasn't expecting to 
it's just so easy to link together different things. This is my best attempt. Uh, there may, I, I may not have something perfect in here, but I will say at the very least, I, uh, like checked with Alex T to see if this works and he said it did. So let's walk through this. First things first, there are two main roles in an attack. The first is an attack roll. The second is a damage roll. There is also going to be a D10 location roll if you connect, which means you're going to determine which part of the body you hit. Depending on which part of the body you hit, it'll have a modifier, usually a little modifier, unless it's like the head or something like that, a little bit plus, a little bit minus, or a zero modifier, okay? But the attack roll is when we determine if, uh, in, in the case of a melee attack, both are going to roll this attack roll. Because in melee combat, you know, you have the benefit of, of uh, being close, having more of a chance to hit. But at the same time, it's, you know, in IRL, a melee combat, it doesn't go one way. You're not going to wait for the person to hit you. And then, you know, it's not a slapping, uh, you know, some Scottish slapping competition. <laughs> so, I don't even know if that's Scots. Is that Irish? Um, okay. So, you know, you, you've slowly done this, you know, Das Macabre and gotten closer together and now you're in melee range, okay? So both of you are going to roll a d20. And again, this, these dyadic dice are perfect. This will be the enemy. This will be me. And let's see what we got. So uh, I have an 11 and a 4, all right? So that's just the base roll. So we have some modifications to do, all right? And actually, it might be just to illustrate this. Um, right now, we have me, the PC, and the enemy. And again, the enemy is in red. And so just straight off for the D20 roll, I have an 11 versus a 4. Now, because I'm the one that initiated or did the first swing, I'm going to get a plus 2. So I'm up to 13. All right. Um, additionally, we are then going to add uh, our uh, attack skills. Now, for the PC, depending on what type of attack you're doing, ranged or melee, you will either add your melee attack skill or your ranged attack skill. For the character I rolled up, I believe they're both the same. They're both 10. So that would put me at 23. Now, an enemy only has one uh, attack roll whether they're doing ranged or melee they may not even be able to do ranged they might only have a melee attack so you can see um we'll, we'll talk probably in a later video more about how to create a uh, enemy combatant but we're just going to say for this this guy has an eight okay so four plus eight twelve so right now we're sitting pretty at 23 and 12. um now we want to look at the enemy's defense which is not armor, it's defense, all right? And so defense could be dodging, it could be whatever, it's, 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 it's what makes it harder to hit. And the defense is actually subtracted from your attack roll. And so we'll say that this enemy's defense is minus three, that's gonna put us down to 20, all right? Not enough, 20 greater than 12, I've got the drop, I'm going to be the one that attacks. If it was the other way around, if the enemy was attacking me, I don't have a defense stat as the player character, but what I can do is for a cost of one to one, I can pay stamina points to reduce my enemy's roll. Here, if say the enemy had a 20 and I had a 12, probably I would have to spend eight to bring that to a tie, okay? And even then, it's not enough to score a hit uh, necessarily. It's whoever is higher, whoever rolls highest that scores a hit, okay? Uh, if there's a tie, the combatant with the highest attribute or skill value wins. So in this case, it would be like the higher who is 
is the attack skill higher independent of how it was applied and in that case in a tie mine was 10 and theirs was eight so i'd win um but but that's important to know right now those are two things that are used to modify the role of the other person the enemy can use their defense or automatically uses their defense to subtract from your running attack roll total and on the other hand you can spend stamina to reduce the enemy's roll plus attack skill etc all right so i've won and that closes out step one okay for step two we're now rolling a d10 and because i'm the one that's attacking we don't roll their d10 anymore they had their chance we roll our d10 and this roll is the damage roll it's whoever wins the attack roll is going to roll their d10 and the results of that they're going to add to that their weapons damage so we'll just say that i have um what are those things called that like uh not bayonets the nightstick the club that like police have with that side handle it's the last thing i looked up in here anyways it's a it, it looks like this um it's a plus d8 okay so the base attack for the pc is always going to be d10 the enemy's damage will be listed for whatever enemy it is it'll say exactly what you're going to roll it'll be like d8 plus 6 d10 plus d4 whatever it is for the pc the base is always going to be or at least as far as i know maybe there's something that modifies this base but like at at, at baseline you roll a d10 plus whatever your weapon is, okay? So that's a d8 that I would roll as well. And then I'm going to roll a d10 on the location table, all right? And uh, let's see if we could get an easy peek here. A d10 location table, I would determine what sort of enemy that I'm attacking. And just for shits and gigs let's do um we'll just roll on the humanoid table and i'm gonna roll a d10 here and that is a two and so i've hit them in their legs and that actually takes my damage down by one right because uh i don't i think if you hit a you know a main artery in the leg it can do some damage but you know i i think for for the sake of the game hitting someone in their legs or feet is probably not going to be as clean of a hit as devastating and so i'd roll a d10 i roll a three and then i'm going to roll a d8 as well eight all right and because i hit that's 11 and because i hit them in the feet it's minus one okay and the last thing that I need to look up then, because right now it seems like I'm about to hit for a 10, I need to look at the enemy's armor. So their defense drops my attack roll, but their armor absorbs uh, a piece of my, uh, my damage roll, okay? And so... I'm just kind of uh, looking up here a an, an an example enemy, which I always have a hard time finding. I don't know why, what the mental block. Okay, so um, okay, for instance, these I seem to use these cat-like creatures for everything when there are so many better things. But this cat-like creature has an armor of one. See, they have a defense of nothing. They have an armor of one, um, and so that would bring it down to nine okay and so you're like okay i took off nine hp nah we don't care about hp okay all that we have to figure out is whether we knocked this cat down or not and to figure that out we look at the constitution of 10 and nine is not enough and so we we do not knock them down all right. And so we would just continue on again because the the hit was not powerful enough to to damage them. All right. And um, 
I should add a little bit about armor. Okay. Um, armor, you have some options here, is that when you are wearing armor in a specific part of the body and that part of the body is hit and say that the armor is not enough to bring the damage down to where they wouldn't get a wound, you can sacrifice that piece of armor and negate that damage completely, but you have to throw off that piece of armor for the remainder of the battle. You can later fix that piece of armor, whether it's gloves, helmet, body suit or whatever, but if it's sacrificed in that way and broken like that, it's a minus one to its armor, okay? It, it's, it degrades is basically what I'm saying. There's also an exception that some weapons are armor penetrating, and when that happens, they go right through the armor. They just ignore however much um, the uh, however much of the damage that armor penetrating weapons do is uh, negates or ign I'm sorry ignores an equal number of armor, and that's something right there that I think is. Um, okay that's probably something that will be okay to look up for each enemy that you have and that's sort of how i've started separating these things in my mind is like things that i need to learn and integrate so that i can run through them not necessarily quickly but seamlessly so that a combat doesn't take me three hours to beat up a cat um, but then there's stuff that I go, okay, this is stuff that I can reference each time. And I would say like armor, armor penetration is something like that, okay? All right. So um, we hit the hit location, uh, the armor, et cetera, et cetera. And we didn't get enough to exceed the constitution, so they were not knocked down. But let's just suppose instead of a three for my D10, let's suppose I threw down an eight which means we have an eight, an eight, a 16, minus one, a 15, and that is going to exceed the um, constitution of that cat. All right, um, one second. Okay, so um, it has to exceed the constitution as far as what the instructions say, if it just meets the constitution is the same, it doesn't count. But in this case, a 15 is gonna be greater than a 10. So that means I'm going to knock the enemy down. All right, so I've struck them so hard that they are knocked down. And when you or an enemy is on the ground, your options are limited. You can only move one hex, you can't spend any stamina, and each in, and each time, each round, you'll be able to roll a recovery check, which is basically a will power check. And you have to pass that and spend five stamina to stand up. If you pass a will check and spend five stamina to st stand up, you have five left. You can use that for an attack if you're cl in close enough range, etc. But Suppose you fail that recovery check, or suppose that the enemy is going to attack before you get up. If you're knocked down and a successful attack is scored against you um, that has a high enough damage to make it you know, through your constitution, you get a wound. All right, and a wound again is the name of the game. So you or whatever the the enemy has a wound. All right. Um, now, if an enemy does do a recovery check after they've been knocked down, this is a little bit of an aside. They have a recovery status. You'll roll like a one d six, and that's going to modify their behaviors or abilities. That again is in their description, so that could be something you reference as it comes up. All right. But just to recap, it. Our damage exceeded the constitution. They were knocked down. The next round, they failed a recovery check. We struck again. Our attack roll was successful. Our damage roll exceeded their constitution. All right. And this means that they are now wounded. And in the case of the, the cat, the cat, I believe, just has... 
I don't know why I'm calling them the cat. Like I'm thinking of like a Cheshire cat and I'm starting to feel bad here. The cat like creatures, not real cats. People don't, don't be upset. They only have one wound. So they're done. They're dead. Okay. A lot of these just have one wound. Um, and there is something called lingering damage, which I could talk about in a later video, but I think it'll confuse things right now. But I, I would consider this rule on solo because it's probably very frustrating to like get through the attack roll, get all the way through the damage roll, and you don't have enough to hit them. I imagine that could, with solo play, could make play kind of tedious. And so this lingering damage like basically allows you to add like a plus D4 uh, cumulatively each time until you score a hit so that you have more and more chance to do to, to get that hit. Okay. So that is close combat. Um, and you know, I, I think that one thing that will be maybe a little bit difficult about my explanation of it is casually switching between talking about the enemy and you um, being hit or knocked down. And so if I wasn't clear on anything, you go ahead and ask a question in the comments and I can try my best to, to clarify it. Okay. So now ranged combat. Now that we, oh, let's, let's just take a look uh, again at the flow chart here. Uh, if our damage roll is greater than their constitution, then they are knocked down. And yes, that's, I think I used a little picture of someone skiing, but it does look like someone's like flying with their legs up in the air here. Um, and while they're knocked down, if they're hit again successfully, they're wounded. And if they hit their max wounds, they are dead. D E D. And um, again, this is something we can look at a little bit later, but like wounds and injuries. Um, each time a character receives a non-fatal wound, that is, if they can sustain more than one wound, they suffer a cumulative minus two to all actions and must roll on the injuries table, which determines the nature of the injury and the effects on the character. And then there's a possibility for like crit and stuff like that. And so the injuries table is going to be sort of like this cumulative thing that's just going to make it harder and harder. And you're going to keep getting these negative twos. And you could say, damn, it's like if I get wounded, I, I'm dead meat. It's like, yeah. If you were in an actual fight and you got like your leg shot, <laughs> it's not like they would be like, all right, let's give him a chance to dust himself off. Okay. So now if you know close combat, range combat won't be so bad. And we have a little same chart here with just some, some interesting, uh, interesting modifications. So whereas in melee attacks, we're both rolling that D20 for the attack roll, we're, we're gonna do that again. The difference is that instead of the enemy adding, or you, depending, whoever is being shot at in a ranged attack, instead of rolling like their a combat skill or an attack skill, they're gonna roll their dex. They're gonna do a dex check, all right? And then um, uh, if, the person who is using the range weapon or shooting, if they are in melee range, that's a minus two to their attack roll. Because again, it's like, think about using a sniper rifle while you're standing two feet away from somebody. It's, it's difficult to do. But otherwise, it's, it's going to work almost exactly the same here, okay? Um, the difference is that, that the person who's being shot at is going to roll dex instead of their combat or attack skill. Uh, there is no plus two for whoever initiates the attack, but there is a minus two if you attempt to do a range combat in melee range. So once again, once we determine who wins that attack roll, we'll then move on to the D10 damage roll and do the same thing of rolling that D10, adding whatever the weapons damage modifier is, we are then going to roll the hit location with a D10, apply the modifiers to that. If there's any armor involved, we're gonna take modify the, the results of that D10 again, uh, with the exception of armor piercing. And then we're gonna compare that once again and uh, use like a little arrow here because there was no sniper rifle is one of like the standard uh, objects in this app. I think that's probably a good thing. Um, but it was an arrow, so that's just ranged versus their constitution. 
Same thing, knock down. They have to roll this recovery roll. If they don't get up, they're wounded, gone. And, you know, something Alex T said is ranged attacks are the name of the game. And that in most modern combat, it's going to be ranged attacks, which is right. You know, I mean, this isn't Warhammer. We don't have chain swords. And that's the thing about Warhammer is like, that's ridiculous. That's why it's like fantasy in space. But I mean, it's ridiculous, but it also rules. But yeah, if you have like high powered laser carbine weapons, you're not going to be like, well, let's just use the nunchucks instead. Ranged combat is going to be um, easier to facilitate because otherwise you're going to constantly, like, especially if you're doing solo play and it's just one, are you really going to do like this? You're going to have to make your way across the floor slowly? No. You're going to want to do a ranged shot, but before you can do that, you do have to consider... Let's see if I was smart enough to write this in the right order. Okay, sorry. We talked about knockdown. We talked about wounds and injury. We'll talk about injury in the next video. Um, enemy combat. I can come back to that. Uh, well, anyway. Oh, there it is. So, um, line of sight. And line of sight's pretty pretty easy. Um, as long as you have a uh, something that is just straight um, like this. And what you'll do is you will just, whoever is initiating the, the combat will just take any part of their token and see if a straight line can be drawn without being, uh, interfered with right here. We can see that there is partial cover here. All right. And so that's going to reduce my range combat skill by two when I, when I add that to the D 20 roll. And so, yeah, you could use a ruler or anything here. Uh, this is like, I think, a disposable chopstick that I use to um, straighten. Well, I use it to eat, um, but it, I keep a disposable one because I use these on my plants if they start to wilt a little bit. hope that's okay. Um, all right. So there are also, in terms of enemy combat i cue myself to page 272 and i'm just going to make sure that i'm not missing anything ah yes i just referenced that to give an example right now is that you know uh some people have really raved about like rolling up uh, an antagonist or an enemy and other people are like oh this takes a long time but there really is just like these subtypes of enemies that whatever subtype they are will tell you a lot about their capabilities and their movement. For instance, like the general red shirt of enemies is a brute and all brutes will have like plus one to hit location rolls. Brutes have no ranged attacks. They can move twice per turn. Um, sort of violates that rule of you can always only move once per turn. But anyways, uh, and then here's some stats. And again, this is this. Let me just say this. Uh, this would really benefit from the sort of Starforged asset deck. I think an asset deck would be amazing for this game to bring those things up so I don't have to page through. But uh, let's not be like lazy Landons. <laughs> we could easily just put that on an index card if we were doing like a whole campaign of this. Let's just do our future selves a favor. Okay. Um, so enemy combat, enemy stats, uh, yeah, again, enemy stats are more simplified. They're just going to have attack, damage, um, defense, armor, and you don't, you know, it's kind of a one size fits all, uh, for whatever type of attack they do. But what was important about the brute there that I saw was that brutes have no ranged attacks. And so it is good to know that so that we can plan our strategy to be like, okay, well, those... Those have an open line of sight on me, but I don't care. Um, and then there is also, for instance, a brute has a pretty um, straightforward behavioral guideline. They either make a melee attack. If you roll a 1 to 7, they melee attack or rush towards the closest opponent. 8 to 10, they use a special ability if ap applicable or makes a melee attack. Um, and these are pretty simple. They just charge headfirst into combat. When we look at a ranged attacker, it has more of an option. Now... Um, 
Just because something is straightforward does not mean it's simple. And just because something's simple does not mean it's straightforward. And I think this is a case of like straightforward, but not simple in that it will take some getting used to. And, I, and honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how I do. And uh, I may have to practice a couple times before I record myself playing this, which I normally don't like to do. Not that I'm like planning it. It'll still be random when I do it. But just doing like um, uh, practice rounds to see how it goes because this seems like a game that is going to take however long it's going to take. And looking this stuff up and determining it slowly is a part of the game. And so what I really have an eye to right now is to see if I can get this to a place where I think it'll make like a good live playthrough because, again, that's that's my style. Uh, NPC combat, again, um, I think this is not uh, the most optimal use of my time to parse this out. This is more of a thing that's easily referenced, but just so that we know what we're talking about here, there is uh, you know, a list of just like options for an NPC, where to go, who they pursue, et cetera, et cetera, is sort of like a very simple AI for them. Um, and that is uh, NPCs that are in like your retinue or your team. Uh, okay, um, defensive maneuvers, we talked about that. One stamina uh, to reduce their attack roll. And again, this is, you got to think like defense is for attack roll. Armor is for damage roll. Um, another thing that I did reach out to ask Alex about was the difference between parrying and dodging. Uh, that distinction is made more clearly in uh, his other games, so I did ask about that, and I'll, in fact, uh, talk about that at the end when I go through the FAQ. Okay, thrown explosives and AoE. So this is something that uh, does give me a little bit of stress when I think about it, and there's no reason for it to because let's just talk it through really quick. Um, oh, let me... I don't know why I'm splitting the screen with this still. All right, so thrown explosives are going to have area of effect, which means that there's going to be a pattern that, you know, depending on where people are around that explosive, they will be affected by it or not affected by it if it hits. So what's going to be used to determine the success of a thrown explosive? It's going to be a dex check, okay? And if that's successful, then the explosion goes right where you wanted it to, and you will point to a hex. And I suppose with different explosives, there's different uh, uh, like ranges, and, and there's definitely different uh, uh, footprints for how the explosion happens. But if you fail the dex check, the explosive lands D4 hexes away from where you wanted in a random direction, and that's determined by a D8. So you just do that and then determine you know, which way it goes. Looks a little confusing, but you just roll the D8, and it's like, oh, west, you count four spaces to the west. If that causes the explosive to exit the combat grid, it's lost without consequence. There are five different area of effects Again, this is something that I think you will reference for quite, a, for quite a while. For me, I know that this is something I will reference every single time it happens just because I am not good at um, necessarily spatial, uh, like especially 2D spatial memorization. But um, a blast is going to, for instance, affect the hexes right in front of the user. Um, and there's like a blast two and a blast four. So different weapons, like this might be like a, uh, a flamethrower and this might be like a plasma rifle or something. I, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, each of these has a different pattern or a different AOE or area of effect. Now you'll notice that there is a, a C or a T. And the C means character, and the T means target. So this is where you are. So this is like you're standing, shooting from there. Um, and then the T is where you're going to throw this thing. It's the target. It's the epicenter, okay? And you can see some of these, like, I would never be able to remember this. I would have to look this up. I'd be like, okay, three up and then diagonal up. It's fine. You just look at it. 
Um, yeah, this is crits. They'll have like some different options. Um, again, I think you just roll on that table every time. There's nothing to memorize there. But just to refresh, since we've been talking a lot and you're probably asleep right now, I hope you're sleeping well. Uh, a critical hit is 20 and a critical miss is one. And critical misses is my beauty pageant that I'm starting. Um, okay, getting in the weeds. Suppressive fire is basically when you have to have a weapon that has full auto, all right? And this is when you spend 10 stamina and it basically says anytime an enemy comes within three hexes of the range and line of sight of this weapon, they're getting lit up. They instantly suffer the weapon's damage. It does consume one ammo and it will go to the next turn. Now you're like one ammo. Yes, ammo is a little bit abstracted in this game. All right. Um, Overwatch is when you delay your action and uh, whenever an enemy enters your line of sight, um, you immediately act using your weapon despite your initiative. Now, if you're anything like me, you say, what the hell is the difference between that? Why would I pay 10 stamina for this? where I can just put myself into Overwatch and like hang on to the stamina. Well, I asked Alex that and we'll talk about the answer. Flanking is a classic example of something and I have no idea why my intuition is this way, but I know I'm absolutely correct. I will never remember <laughs> to apply this. I don't know what the hell is wrong with me, but I looked at this, I read it, I go, I'm always going to forget to do this. But basically it's when two Allied combatants occupy opposite sides of an enemy's space um, like this. It's a plus two uh, to the to the um, uh, attack roll, which is sometimes called combat roll. And I do think that's something that um, was really difficult of understanding this that could really easily improve the readability of this is to make sure that we distinguish in the text attack roll and damage roll because and and i usually think that i'm a little over obsessive with this when i write uh, uh rpgs or, or you know I'm, I'm gming or whatever i will always underline the term or i will always bold it and it does help though because i just lose track when you're calling it an attack roll and it's capital letters and it's underlined and now it says combat roll and I go wait is combat roll damage roll and I have to keep like switching back and forth in my head it's just something that could be made more clearly uh, in a pretty easy way uh, desperate attack that's basically you throw in caution to the wind it's a little trade-off you get an extra d10 to your combat skill but you are open to potential attacks and the next time someone attacks you, they're going to get a D10 on their attack roll. So they're probably going to connect. So it's 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 like one of those things where it's like you better, you know, you best not miss um, because then you're open. Disengaging in a, uh, attacks of opportunity. Um, if you play, again, if you play any XCOM games, it's very common where if you are right next to a someone in combat, in like uh, just right next to them in melee, and you walk away from them, just disengaging like that, uh, you have to pass a dex check. And uh, you have to roll against the dex of this person. And if you fail, they will do an attack of opportunity that hits automatically. So they'll basically just roll their damage die and hit you. And so that's if you disengage. There's also an attack of opportunity. Say that I was transiting this way and I like came across. And since it's just a one hex movement in this game, no matter what, I don't know if it's just like, because if that's the case, I would just never move in front of them, but it's wherever your hex sides would touch and they haven't been touching before. The other problem with this though, is that um, now that I'm thinking about it, is it seems to me that every time you'd go in for a melee attack, you'd trigger an attack of opportunity because you have to get next to them to do that. So uh, I will um, look into that, but that's a little bit more details. And then um, an optional rule is random combat events worth mentioning. Uh, luck in this game again is like inspiration and you can, sorry, Overwatch, 
Blanking, we'll always forget. Desperate attack. Disengage and attack of opportunity. I'm going to make sure I look that up. And uh, escaping every time you go off the grid. We talked about wounds and injuries. Yeah, optional combat. Here's the optional rules that I listed. Combat stance. Lingering damage is where you add those D4s so that it's more likely to win that attack roll over time. And then these random combat events I think are kind of interesting because luck, um, you you could spend a luck point, which is like an inspiration. And if you do that, you can trigger a uh, random combat event. And usually these will be in your favor, but sometimes they aren't. Like what was the one that I saw? Oh, like if you roll a six... A new random opponent joins the fight attacking both sides. God, that would be annoying. So I'm like totally desperate. I'm like, oh, what do I do? Oh, yeah, I have a luck. And then all of a sudden, ha, ha, and I'm like, oh, God, here comes this asshole. Um, okay. So last thing uh, that I um, will, will tell you to lead into the FAQ is this thing that I was uh, agonizing over was this line that said – that if two people are in melee and somebody is going to make a ranged attack, say I want to make this, this, this guy wants to make a ranged attack here, and we have the line of sight, right? And it says, even when you're in range, you still have a 50% chance of hitting the wrong person uh, in a melee. And so basically what that means, like I came up with three ways to resolve that. One of them was a coin toss. One of them was a D100 uh, just to do a percentage. And then one of them was like I would roll both of their dexes and whoever's lower will get hit. Uh, and Alex's response, you shall see, hint. He's just like, yes, just roll a D100 and it's under or over 50 or you can roll a coin. Okay, um, I think uh, if you still have it in you, we're at about an hour 20. That's okay. I'm feeling fresh. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like this video could be helpful. I really wanted there to be a video like this when I first started playing. Uh, I hope this is helpful. Okay, so FAQ. Um, I got to do like actually the little minimize thing really quick. So let me just do that. Okay, um, I, for the most part, just took what I wrote verbatim and then I added uh, Alex's responses in red. I am not going to torture you by reading through all this. This is basically how I determined if like I had the right conceptions of things. Uh, does that sound right? Everything's correct. You got it. I don't have anything to add. How nice is Alex? Uh, okay, my next question. When you say that range attack fired in a melee, this is just what I was talking about. Should I roll a percentage? Should I do flip a coin? Should I do a dex roll? It says, if you're attacking with a ranged weapon and your target is engaged in melee combat with another character, there's a 50% chance you'll hit the wrong target. You can either roll a D100, and if you roll less than 50, it means you hit at your target, and over that, you hit at the other target, or flip a coin, or whatever works. Regardless of who the target ends up being, you make the usual opposed check against them. So what that indicates to me is before we even do like the attack roll we're going to determine who is getting hit here. And that is such a tough uh, emotional task, I have to say, where it's like, you know, it's like I'm really losing. And my, uh, like, I make this, uh, my guy's stuck in melee. Let's just say that this is my guy since this is who I have out. And then, you know, whatever I do, my, um, I say, okay, um, you know, I need to hit a two here. And I hit a one and I go, damn it. And now I have to calculate out like a dex check and then an, a damage check. But I know I'm about to like hit my own guy. Uh, that's a that's a tough emotional task. Um, I like it. OK, uh, let's see here. Uh, is there a OK, this is my qu next question. Is there a difference between dodging and parrying? Uh, I can see in Broken Shores, another game, there are separate rules. It looks like parrying has an advantage of making use of your weapon, but there's like cost to it. I won't bore you with that. And Alex says, no, they're both just defensive maneuvers. These words don't have any mechanical connotations. Uh, so there's no difference between dodge and parry in this game right now. Do defensive maneuvers have to be declared in advance or do I spend the stamina as it's happening, presuming I have it? 
Spend it as it happens. Ideally, you'll save some stamina for defensive maneuvers after acting or if the enemy acts before you. You should try to find a balance between how much stamina you spend defending before you get a chance to attack. Good. All right, long thing, but basically I'm, I asked about the armor thing because I, there's this line that says, the armor piece is destroyed and the armor's total protection is reduced by one. And I was like, huh? And so he says it's both. It would be destroyed for the battle and afterwards, but you can repair it outside of combat with a tech check, the same as a weapon. But even if you repair it, its total protection is permanently reduced by one, which, you know, I'm, I'm sure at the beginning of the game would, would make, like, render some of these things completely useless. If someone passes a recovery check and spends five stamina to stand and then they're already in melee range, can they swing for a melee attack? Yes, they can! How fun. Um, so, yeah, if, if somebody, you know, passes that recovery check, they stand up, they still got five stamina left, Let's, it's on. They don't have to wait for that. Uh, in his line of sight, the rule for Overwatch, because if that's the case, it seems like most ranged weapons would have a huge footprint for Overwatch. Is there another way to determine what cone of coverage Overwatch is for? So just, just so if people aren't familiar with how Overwatch will often happen in like video games, is that if a person goes into Overwatch, you'll choose like a zone of the Overwatch and then somebody will have to go into that zone and it's usually a cone. So the best way that I have of showing this, and unfortunately I think it's the same color on the same color here, but I would declare Overwatch in this direction and then anyone who like enters into this cone of space that transits through that, it would trigger it and my attack would happen right away. And Alex says, yes, it's just line of sight. Ranged weapons are king. You don't see many real sh soldiers rushing to melee. So I think that's an important point from strategy perspective as well as uh, realism. Uh, is there a functional reason I would choose to overwatch rather than suppressive fire? Because I know suppressive fire costs 10 stamina and one ammo. Um, I couldn't see the Overwatch cost. Is any character who has not used all 10 stamina automatically in Overwatch? It says not all weapons can use suppressive fire, but all weapons can be used for Overwatch. So suppressive fire seems like more powerful. Um, you don't need to spend all stamina as an Overwatch action. It's only, I guess, if it's triggered. But then again, that's like, is everyone automatically in Overwatch? I guess if you declare it, you can be an overwatch, but then I guess that if somebody walks into that zone, then you use your stamina up and you may not have it to like defend. Um, maintaining health, okay, so this is what I asked about stealth. Maintaining stealth costs five stamina. The idea of, use, of, of using this is that I could sneak up and hit another player. I'm so sorry for these commas. I was doing a lot of this with voice to text, I promise. I don't just put periods and commas in the middle of sentences. But if stealth costs five stamina and then movement costs five and then an attack costs at least three, how would I ever do all three of these? And if maintaining stealth also includes movement, wouldn't I just want to maintain stealth every single time I move? So basically what I was saying here is like, if I maintain stealth for five, move for five and attack for five, that's more than I have. If uh, maintaining stealth action also includes movement of one hex, then wouldn't I always maintain stealth? Why would I ever walk normal? And we said, yeah, stealth isn't really a proper option right now. I need to give it a redesign. Right now, the only way to use stealth, move, and attack would be by having a combination of the right talents, such as movement, econ economy, and vigorous, but there are more, plus gear and tools that give you more stamina or free movement. Uh, not sure it's worth the effort putting a stealth build together, maybe at high levels and with the cool implants and Vimonic tech stuff. So Alex has spoken. I did post my melee flow chart uh, to my community page. Uh, I'll try to like once I make sure I'm gonna um, just tighten tighten both those up a little bit after I play through a couple times just so I know that they work. Um, but I hope that that was a a worthwhile intro to um, combat. I hope you will let me know what you think about this new intro. Was it noticeable, the mistakes in it? I hope you'll watch the solo RPG campaign. I hope you'll buy the fate mill. I hope you'll follow every other person who comments on this page and subscribe to them and follow them too. 
hope all your dreams come true except that one dream where you have consumed an entire house all the wood all the pipes you ate it all okay uh i think that we're just gonna say goodbye old school style with my outro